Good afternoon to everyone in the room and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those of you around the world joining us virtually as well. My name is Krishna Odaikumar. I'm the director of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center here at Duke University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's Think Global session, which is focused on building trust in public health, a post-COVID roadmap. We know that trust is really central to everything we do in public health and global health and health care. Because much of what we do is to help others to make individual and organizational decisions that are really based on trust among each other. We also know that trust in institutions have been in decline for decades. And what we saw over the course of the last three years with the COVID-19 pandemic was a further acute decline in many ways of that trust in public health and in different ways around the world. Over the next hour, we're gonna explore the causes of this crisis of trust, unpack the unique challenges of building and maintaining trust in public health leaders and institutions, and also identify key priorities to build trust going forward. Let's see if we can come out with some actionable steps. We go into this recognizing that some of these principles are gonna be globally applicable, but local context is incredibly important. We've got speakers joining us from around the world. We're largely gonna be focused on what's happening in the US, somewhat in Europe and also in Africa, but also we'll bring in other global regional perspectives as we go. And we're also going to incorporate insights from a recent meeting that we were able to uh, hold, attended by many of those joining us today as speakers uh, that allowed us to uh, bring together global cross-sectoral experts to think about some key actions needed to begin to restore confidence that focused on this idea of communities, communications, and confidence, and those are areas we'll unpack as we go. A bit of housekeeping, this is a hybrid uh, session as we talked about, uh, so please do actively participate. Those of you in the room, raise your hand to, uh, to ask questions, be part of this conversation. We've got uh, a Q&A uh, button uh, for those of you joining us virtually. Please do send questions as we go, and we'll try to incorporate them along the way. I wanna start by introducing our speakers. You've got their full bios, which are incredibly impressive in the uh, meeting material. So I'm gonna very briefly introduce them here. We've got uh, Mark McClellan, who is a colleague here at Duke and the director of the uh, Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. We've got uh, Mandy Cohen, uh, who is at Adelaide, the executive vice president and chief executive officer of, uh, of Adelaide Care Solution. Uh, and is joining us here in her capacity most recently as a secretary of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, where she led the state's COVID response. We've got Heidi Larson, who's an anthropologist and director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she's a professor of anthropology, risk, and decision science. We've got Rispa Walumbe, who's a global health specialist focused on advocacy and healthcare policy at national, regional, and global levels. And she's joining us as a senior health policy advisor at AMREF Health Africa. And we've got Jack Leslie, a strategic communications executive, political consultant, international development expert. And we're really thrilled to also announce that Jack, as of yesterday, has joined Duke uh, formerly as a senior visiting fellow here at the Duke Global Health Institute and as a visiting fellow at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, where he'll be helping us lead efforts that address this particular topic. So thank you all for joining. Looking forward to a great conversation. I want to get us started by going uh, to Mark, and uh, especially because this is really an effort while we're here under a DGHI uh, event. This is really across Duke, and the Duke Park Olaf Center is really a core partner to, to moving this work forward. So over to you, Mark. Uh, thanks very much, Christian. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, as you mentioned, Duke Margolis uh, Center for Health Policy and the Duke Global Health Institute partner to work across the university with a shared mission related to improving healthcare, health, and health equity. And in COVID, we found this breadth of perspectives and resources to draw on extremely helpful, especially in addressing the health disparities that emerged across racial and ethnic groups, urban and rural populations, people with different political outlooks. The pandemic was notable, not just for its very large impact, arguably the largest economic impact of any event in the United States since World War II and a much larger loss of life, 
but for how it showed, for better or worse, that the response to future public health emergencies like this one depends on many individuals and organizations working together to help provide trusted and accurate information to everyone alongside timely, clear, and accurate guidance from public health authorities. That includes healthcare professionals and community health workers. Uh, for this pandemic and certainly in the future, we will have tests available rapidly, treatments available within a few months, safe and effective vaccines potentially within six months at scale. So healthcare is going to have a huge role in any future public health threat like this, not to mention the fact that the whole concept of test to treat now can work for many other conditions where public engagement is needed for success, that includes cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hepatitis C, HIV AIDS, the list goes on and on. Local community leaders and social service organizations also have very important trusted relationships within their communities and are playing an increasingly important role in addressing the sources of health inequities in a pandemic and beyond. And finally, businesses are another example where we were able to develop a substantial degree of support because they have trust from their workforce and interest in addressing the issues that matter to their employees and families and communities. So addressing trust, connecting everyone in our diverse communities to sources that they can trust for clear and timely information is both critical to our mission at Duke Margolis to improve population health and it requires some new ways of engaging sources of support alongside traditional public health. We were very pleased to support Mandy Cohen in this kind of broad-based approach taken by the state of North Carolina to address these issues in the pandemic, along with working with a range of other policy leaders around the country and around the world in collaboration with DGHI. And I also want to thank Heidi and Rispa for their leadership and insights, uh, both to get us to this point and today going forward. And finally, Christian, as you mentioned, we're very pleased to have Jack Leslie joining us and DGHI here at Duke to help pull these important threads together across the university and our broader communities to address one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. So thanks very much for putting this on. Thank you, Mark. Uh, great to, to hear some of those key insights that already come out and certainly unpack many of those points. <laughs> and as you noted, um, uh, Mandy has been a, a fantastic leader here in North Carolina. Let me uh, bring you in, Mandy. You really provided such strong leadership and I think widely seen as one of the best statewide responses, certainly here across the U.S. We'd love to start this conversation with your perspectives, uh, having led that response about lessons learned, especially as they relate to this issue of trust. Well, Thank you, um, Krishna, for that introduction and very, very kindly saying that we had a great response in North Carolina. It was it was um, a hard, hard uh, effort uh, and a team effort amongst many. Um, but I am really proud of the North Carolina results. If you look at some of the rankings that they've been doing about where state, uh, states that were safest, North Carolina is ranked number two, only behind Vermont. And I think North Carolina is quite a different kind of state than Vermont in terms of diversity, not just politically, race, ethnicity, rural, urban. Um, so we had a lot of challenges. And But I, I do think one of the reasons for our success was because we prioritized trust and we called it out, we named it very early on. Before we even had our first case, we were talking about that, that our crisis response was going to hinge on whether we could build and maintain trust with, with the public as we go through a crisis. Um, and as Jack, who's the communications expert, would probably tell you, in, in a communications crisis, you want to have all the information you possibly can at the beginning um, and then communicate and figure out how you're going to say it and what you're going to say. That was not going to be possible, obviously. This was an evolving crisis, real-time learning. Um, and so we really thought intentionally about how to build and maintain trust. And I think when I reflect back, it wasn't quite as clear at this, but we tried to be really tactical about trust, which is can be feeling very uh, 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 ephemeral um, and fleeting. We tried to be really tactical about it and it really broke down into three buckets for, for me. The first was transparency. The second is competence, which I heard you mention. Um, and the third is relationships. Um, and so I'll, I'll go through uh, each, but I do wanna say before I start uh, on those three buckets of transparency, competence, and relationships, that 
that I couldn't have done the work I did unless the trust started with the governor of North Carolina, Governor Roy Cooper, trusting me and my team. Um, and that was that was fundamental. So you actually have to have trust within the team that is doing the response effort. Um, and I think that is really, really critical. Um, so transparency, right? Just think about in your own life, who are the people that you you trust, right? And the, the, they're, the, they're not the folks who are closed off and are a black box and you don't know what they're thinking, right? So transparency for me is so fundamental. And the way we demonstrated tactically transparency was a lot, a lot, a lot of press conferences. Um, we did more than 170 press conferences within 18 months, in addition to many, many, many other interviews. I, I, so, so many, <laughs> so much, so much uh, answering questions. But then we also made a ton of information publicly available. Um, and in that transparency, we really tried to maintain an ability to say, this is what I know, this is what I don't know, and I'm going to be back tomorrow to give you more information, right? It's not going to be a week from now, two weeks from now. I'll be back tomorrow and tell you what else I've learned in the last 24 hours. Um, our website, you know, was, we, we spent a lot of time making sure not only was our data complete, but it was accurate and timely so that folks could see what information we were using to make decisions. So that transparency was really important. So second on competence, and I think this is really important as we think about public health and Mark's important comment about linking public health to the other sectors that are necessary for response. Mm -hmm. um, competence and execution matters. So it was important as I, I, the governor had me lead the COVID response that I wasn't just a scientist or a public health leader that was an epidemiologist looking at the data, but I had my hand on the wheel and I was responsible for and accountable for the execution. Did the tests go to the places that they need to? Did the vaccines go to the place that they need to? Did Are we collecting the data in a way to give us transparency on how to make decisions? How do we distribute, right? So the competence in the execution was my accountability as well as understanding the science and the, and the data. And I think putting those two together was really important because it allowed me to build trust across both the science and the execution. So I could say, we need this and we're doing that. Um, and so, and then we had to say, we had to do what we say, right? Think about your own life and who you trust, right? You, if someone says something, they do it. Um, that was also really important for us not to overpromise, right? We, we, I, if anything, I wanted to underpromise and overdeliver um, in our execution, um, but it also required us to have a pretty heavy hand in from a state perspective of saying, where, where are the resources getting distributed and can I make sure that that's happening with standardization across the state? And then the last part um, on relationship, and then I'll turn it back to, to, um, to others. Um, it was really, really important that this, we didn't try to solve this problem out of public health alone, right? Those relationships are hugely, hugely important. I wanna call out the relationships with the hospital systems. Um, they, they bore a ton of, of, of the work um, whether it was obviously the patients who were inpatient, who were the really, really sick ones, and making sure we had bed capacity. I saw competitors, you know, hospital systems, health systems, usually competitors. I saw collaboration. But to be honest, like we had to forge that collaboration um, a lot of times, and we did it at the state level. I met with the CEOs of all of our big hospital systems every single week um, to make sure that we were aligned. And they did a fantastic job sharing the burden of making sure we had ICU beds, ventilators, masks, vaccine, right? There was there was sharing going on in collaboration that I honestly have never seen before in my in my career. And that those relationships are so important, right? So because it, it's not just about directives, it's about humans um, trying to pull together um, through this. And then I'd also say the relationships we had with community. And we put equity at the center of our of our work. We really connected with um, the African American community, Hispanic community, we use lots of community health workers, um, and really thought about how do we resource communities to be their own advocates and to to really help um, in the response effort. So that's a lot there. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks again, um, and really appreciate the, the focus of this topic. Great, thank you, Mandy. Fantastic insights from from really strong leadership there, and um, the idea of transparency competence and relationship certainly I think is is striking and one that I, I think we'll continue to come back to. And I also want to highlight I think the key point you made, which is that you've got to be able to combine the science with execution 
uh, if you're going to get both results and also instill trust going forward. Uh, let me now bring into this conversation Heidi. Uh, Heidi, you've done an enormous amount of, of really groundbreaking research and led efforts through the Vaccine Confidence Project and in other ways to help us really understand in a nuanced way uh, what are the drivers of trust that we see, whether it's for vaccine confidence or other aspects of public health. Uh, let me turn the floor over to you to help us uh, parse what the evidence says and uh, what in your mind are some of the key levers to think about trust. Uh, you're <laughs> okay. I was being diligent about following <laughs> instructions here. Um, well, I, I have to say first, uh, congratulations to Mandy because she really uh, hit every um, point in the book that in all of our research over a couple decades on trust, um, it couldn't have articulated better all these critical features of transparency, competence, but particularly the following up and uh, the, the biggest thing that we've seen as a concern from the public and uh, our work at the Vaccine Confidence Project and my, uh, my new uh, work, which is called the Global Listening Project, which is a, a global um, study on people's experience of the pandemic, the number one thing we're hearing across multiple settings is um, a, disc a feeling of disconnect with with government. They would give us these uh, directives, but they people felt that had no connection with their reality, their situation. Directives about uh, school, you know, that you can't sit next to each other, the kids can't sit next to each other. And one teacher told me, has that has the prime minister or has the person giving the policy ever been in a school? Do they know what the implications are? But we heard that around the world. So I think the relevance um, uh, that was mentioned is really important. Um, I'm going to zoom through. A, really, I, I know I have uh, five minutes to um, say uh, with a big task here. Um, let's see. The host disabled screen share. We'll get that fixed here. OK. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'll just um, walk through. I think that relevance issue um, the other thing we've seen um, how much is that uh, a lot is how fragile trust is. Um, it's uh, it's very volatile. It's it's particularly more than ever. Has is this um, okay? I'm I'm on now. Uh, sorry. Okay. I don't want to waste time here. Um, okay, here we go. Um, share. So uh, uh, as I was saying, the, the first thing is that trust is, is volatile. Um, we saw, uh, I was part of the Welcome Global Monitor on Public Trust in Science and Health, and we saw that building up to uh, 2020, um, trust was higher in 2020 than 2018 globally, uh, not everywhere. Uh, that didn't include Africa, by the way. But at the same time, the next year, we get the Pew uh, study on trust and public declined over the last year. So COVID already was starting to take a hit on the trust that, that was being built. So I think if there's a takeaway on this is trust is fragile, handle with care, and uh, many of the points that Mandy just made about constantly nurturing it, never taking it for granted, um, continuing to stay in touch with people. Um, in that uh, welcome study, we found that even though overall in the world, trust had gone up a bit between 2018 and 2020 in a lot of domains of science and medicine, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it went down. And, and the point in this slide is when you break down that trust in science in, I included the Americas and Africa here because that was, was the ask in terms of regional focus, I understand for today. Um, is that the difference between asking a question like trust in science or trust in scientists 
also matters. You get a lot of people, I mean, I've seen various pieces of research that say, oh, trust in government has gone down. Well, what aspect of government? Was this the national leader or was it um, your local mayor or your governor? Because maybe you have a lot of confidence in your governor and your local mayor and, and your lead uh, in health. Uh, and that's what we need to know. Until we unpack where the trust levers are, we can't address them. Um, this is the consequence of this declining trust. Uh, we do a lot of work with Africa CDC monitoring trust on, on a number of domains. But in uh, November, December of 2020, there was incredible high willingness and enthusiasm for vaccines, aside from DRC, but uh, in general, it was pretty high. And in, in all of these countries, um, two years later, it really bottomed out. And what did we do wrong? We're doing a lot of work trying to understand, aside from the phantom cargo that vaccines were coming and didn't, um, which was a huge um, dis disappointment. Um, and the pandemic effect, you know, we had so many opportunities to build confidence, but globally it's taken a hit on decreasing confidence because people had expectations. Um, in our global uh, listening project, um, we one of the things we heard, and one of the when I see a, um, a slide like this, I want to know why, what's going on there, what what are the people thinking and and seeing, and in Abuja, we heard after the lockdown, we heard mostly about food shortages, the anxiety, what if, if lockdown, how am I going to feed my family? But then they felt like the government didn't take it seriously. They didn't. They said they were giving things, and they didn't. Um, unlike what we just heard, this importance of accountability. Um, when you don't have that accountability, that can also be a trust breaker. And then when things weren't said straight, it can really be a, a negative thing. So we're all um, thinking about community. We all recognize when people say to me, you know, what worked. Um, hyperlocal, hyperlocal, state level, um, community level, uh, in the absence and the disappointments that some countries had with their national level heads, um, it was where community, but we were, we were surprised to learn, and this is my last slide, um, that actually not everyone wanted to be labeled or addressed as a community, which was kind of a surprise, because I always th think, and I think in public health, we think um, that community is a good thing. It is when it means, as the as the young woman in Delhi and Sao Paulo said, um, it was our problem. We were, it wasn't just my problem, it was our problem. There was a sense of community. In Sao Paulo, people taking care of each other. This is my sense of community. And in Abuja, even though what we heard in, from some people about disappointment from national level, they say in our community, we helped each other. You don't want to see your neighbor hungry. The, it's a longer quote about, you know, my neighbors running out of gas and cooking together. And um, But then we heard in Paris and in, in a couple other places, I don't want to be in a community. I don't want to be stigmatized. Belonging to one community excludes you from the other. The next speaker is going to be talking about community. Um, so I won't say anything more except... One thing we saw that was absolutely an important lever of trust is hope. And to not be giving messages like, you know, jabs in arms, as they said in the UK, but that we're going to get through this together. Don't be focused on the specific intervention when people really care about getting food on the table, losing their job, and, and managing their families. And if the message is constantly get your vaccine, you're going to lose them. So I, I really look forward to the, the next uh, comments on community. And, and thank you so much again to um, uh, Mandy. I, I'm really uh, very moved by it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Heidi. I think great to put some data behind what we've been seeing and, and certainly sobering in terms of some of the losses we've had recently, but also perhaps um, uh, some paths forward and thinking about these hyper-local types of models and building from the ground up, um, thinking to make sure that we're recognizing that trust is is both fragile and dynamic and also making sure that models of accountability are, are baked into public health and health interventions more broadly. Um, 
Let me bring in now to the conversation, Rispa. Uh, you've done a lot of work thinking about policy at different levels, but also about community engagement, community empowerment. Would love to get your thoughts on what you're seeing uh, on the ground of uh, the regional context, as well as uh, as uh, what you've seen uh, work or not work at that community engagement level. Thank you so much, Krishna. And it's it's lovely to see a lot of familiar faces um, again after some time, especially in the new year. Um, so it's 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 a very tall order to come after Mandy and Heidi, but I'll I'll try and take the reins on this and give that regional perspective. Um, so you know, coming from the African continent, I think when we look at trust, um, you know, there's there's trust in when we look at trust in public health, it's really looking at it's starting with trust in those institutions and systems within the public health ecosystem and how do people view that and I think I'll take kind of two areas that you know AMREF really focused on which was really that you know the fact that these systems and institutions don't operate in a vacuum and for them to operate effectively they actually have to operate with different sectors, um, and that included, you know, both state and non-state actors, both public and private sector actors, and of course those in the social, um, economic, and political side. And this was a very huge orchestration, and I think Mandy outlined this quite a bit. Um, but on the second level, I think I'll also say that um, communities, going back to that communities angle, is that communities are actually pivotal in thinking through trust, as it's how we are organized you know, across the world, but especially in the African continent, we're really organized around communities and that's how we, we view ourselves. That's what our identity really is. And, and, um, and that's, that's something that is really critical for how even we approached, um, you know, the COVID-19 challenges. Um, but when you look at trust through these two lenses of community and multi-sectoral action, um, and how do you craft a post uh, COVID-19 roadmap for what kind of lessons were there? Um, there are instances which fractured trust at these levels of global, regional and national, but there are also in instances where trust was enhanced. So I'll talk about the instances where trust was um, enhanced as a starter. Um, and one of the key things that happened is that it was a very clear kind of, we rallied around a very singular issue. It was COVID-19. It was identified as a key problem. And because it was identified as a key problem and that it was affecting all of us, um, you know, there was very centralized communication. So I'll look at it from, you know, even like the government level. This was everything directly from the highest office in the land um, in many countries where the president actually led the charge when it came to tackling COVID-19. Um, even for the centralized, the consistent messaging through each phase, um, it was actually orchestrated from the presidential level and down to even um, the ministers where even the health minister was taking charge of the ministerial um, committee that was responsible for mobilizing resources from public and private sector. And also um, the, because the president led the charge, one, it was taken very seriously, right? So it was something that was considered, um, this is a really big deal where, you know, we kind of have to sit up and listen. Um, and then also just to talk about then, you know, that, that authority is that there was actually a clear path to conveying a particular message. So anything that had to do with managing lockdowns, anything that had to do with managing, um, you know, disbursement of funds for, you know, communities that were, you know, um, disenfranchised or that were from low income communities where we needed to provide additional um, services, this was actually done from a presidential level. Um, when it came to the key interventions that needed to be given, whether it came to vaccines, whether it came to specific, um, medical information that came from the Ministry of Health. And there were two specific people responsible for that. Aside from the cabinet secretary, like for instance, in Kenya, you had um, the director general for health and you also had the chief administrative secretary. So this was very clear. And similar to Mandy's case, there was consistent messaging. And you can see this throughout the continent. It's very important that with each phase, you're actually continuously engaging. So even now, as much as you know, we've kind of come into a newer phase of you know, what it looks like in the aftermath of the pandemic, it created a situation where actually people wanted to learn more about what was going on within ministries of health. So 
there was also enhanced communication between um, government uh, sectors. So you look at it from the perspective of across different countries, there was a lot of engagement because they actually sat down and a lot of the challenges were that we couldn't engage with kind of like our global um, partners. So we looked internally as a region to see how do we figure things out? How do we, who was able, already had those systems in place that could enhance, for instance, but um, manufacturing of protective uh, uh, equipment? And how do we make sure that our neighbors in Tanzania um, were able to access this or our neighbors in Senegal or things like that? Um, there was also a lot of private sector coordination, and that's part of what I led, where I led the secretariat for the private sector um, entity representative of health. Um, and this was bringing together all the different actors. This is manufacturers. This is, um, you know, this is um, all the different um, people who play in the space of private sector, from technology to pharmaceuticals. And it was really critical to bring those players together because Part of that was also making sure that we understood that the government was the lead and it was taking their cue and figuring out, okay, how do we meet you at your point of need? But at the, at, I think at the core of it was really now down to communities um, because within communities, it was really understanding who are seen as trustworthy in the community. And based off of our experience over the many years we've been in existence, it was really community health workers and it was healthcare providers who were seen as trusted people in the community. And they were seen as trusted, not and because it didn't happen overnight, but these are actually people who have been in the community who identified as community leaders by default and because of what they've done, but they're also with community members on the darkest times of their, in, in some of the darkest times of their lives, right? So it was easy for us to kind of see how to bridge the gap in terms of what communities needed. And um, through making sure one, we did a lot of trainings for healthcare workers um, to be able to ensure that some of these measures that we were asking communities to carry out, they were the ones conveying like the direct messaging. They were there sitting with them because they also saw this on TV that this is what you're supposed to do. So the community health workers really took them through that process. Um, and the same, and this is continuously at each stage, whether it was from the points where everyone was wearing masks to the point where people were getting the vaccine until now. And then I guess finally, one of the things that uh, we did was really see communities as key stakeholders. Um, so when it came to a point where you didn't, uh, you were finding that you were looking at an intervention, you've talked about it and communicated effectively, and the community was still not receptive towards it, it was really about identifying, okay, then what, what, what is a key challenge with this? And that meant sitting down with the community and, and figuring out what exactly is the challenge and how can we meet you at the point of need, because this is something critical, for instance, as a vaccine. Um, and, and that required a lot of consistent you know, messaging. The only challenge we had with this, and I think Heidi alluded to this, was that we were talking about them getting the vaccine. A lot of people did get it, but when you, um, but there was because of supply chain challenges, that was really a, a blow to that trust you've been building throughout each and every one of these stages. Um, and that, that kind of, you know, made us really rethink how to go about this. But I think it's just really critical to understand that there are all these players, but I think when you look at communities as one key entity, and then look at all these other multi-sectoral actors who are responsible for instance, manufacturing or trade or agriculture, all of these players actually played a really huge part in the trust ecosystem. Thanks. Thank you, Rispa. That was such a, a rich uh, set of uh, perspectives there. Um, highlighting the need for multi-sectoral engagement, the, the role of community. And also a reminder that that you know, can shift over time, um, making the point that there has to be consistency of messaging. Actually saying, a, saying something once is, uh, is likely not going to work. And then making sure, going back to this idea of competence and accountability, uh, this idea of trustworthiness. So who are the individuals or institutions that are deemed to be trustworthy as trusted sources over time? So thank you, that was fantastic. Let me bring in our last speaker now, uh, Jack Leslie. Uh, Jack, would love to get your thoughts on everything you've heard, uh, but really also, I think you bring a, a, a slightly different perspective to this with your uh, tremendous background in the uh, 
the public affairs, political consulting, and, and really having thought through this from a socio-political lens as well. So we'd love to add that perspective to what we've heard so far. Sure. Well, thanks, Krishna. And by the way, just thank you and, and Mark and your teams at TGHI and, uh, uh, and uh, Margolis. You guys organized that conference, which maybe we'll talk a little bit about in the Q&A in Bellagio and really drove it. So appreciate it. And Mandy and and Heidi and Rispo were all part of it as well. So it's good to see all of you again. And I'm delighted, by the way, to obviously to join the Duke team and working, you know, on this on this critical issue. Um, I, you know, we've covered a lot uh, in the last half hour with with Mandy and Heidi and Rispa. I, I think, you know, I heard again and again, and I hope in our discussion we can talk about some specific ways that we can engage in this, but that community uh, is is so much of what's important, the hyper-local point that, that Heidi made. Um, and so that, you know, that community engagement drives so much of that, whether you're in Nairobi or North Carolina, as Rispa and Mandy can, can attest. I wanna try to open up the lens just a little bit um, and talk about, as you said, uh, Krishna, the socio-political um, background to all of this, because it's not new. Um, I kidded with you right after my time in Bellagio that I spent a lot of time thinking about it and I came away with the realization that um, the things I know most about are things we can probably do the least about and the things I know least about are the things hopefully where we'll make some progress. Um, trust, as I said, is not, is not new. It's been around, or the lack of trust has been around for a long, long time. As a political consultant, I saw communications really drive a lot of it in fact, 30 years ago, television, the, the new medium back then, or relatively new in politics, uh, had a huge influence by allowing candidates to bypass political parties and go right into the living rooms of candidates. And so all of the issues of ideology um, really fell by the wayside and character and trust became, uh, became so much more important. And then of course, we had the second wave of evolution in communications, which is social media. Uh, and, and that um, has obviously really propelled, you know, identity politics that we talk about in polarization, not just in the United States, but, but all around the world. And of course, it's also, we haven't mentioned yet, you know, a key source of misinformation and disinformation um, that uh, we saw move elections, but more seriously in this pandemic, uh, led to some real serious public health uh, uh, issues like the vaccine hesitancy that, that um, Heidi spoke about. Um, and in some Western countries, in fact, in probably most Western countries, it's particularly um, talked about in the United States and the UK, uh, there's another but you know, very related dynamic at work and that's the rise of populism and anti-elitism. So we've had kind of a perfect storm, certainly in the US and Europe, that's fueled this populism and anti-authoritarian movement. It's a trifecta almost. You had the Great Recession you know, in, in 08, followed by waves of immigration, both in Europe and here, and then a pandemic. You know, and all of that was kind of a toxic stew that increased a longstanding decline in trust in most, um, most institutions. Um, and, and all of you know that happened before COVID. In fact, you know, when you look at the, the data and, and Heidi uh, is really the source of most of it, uh, we had pretty high trust in, in trust scientists and public health institutions prior to the pandemic relative to other institutions, which had really taken a hit over the last 20 years. What so concerned me as I got involved working with you, Krishna, on things like the COVID, COVID collaborative was to see how much more uh, of a hit public health specifically took um, during, during the pandemic. So it's great that we have um, certainly the three speakers who came before me who can really uh, parse out the lessons that we learned um, from that uh, pandemic and what's needed going forward. Um, and I just say at the end, in terms of trying maybe to set up the discussion a little bit and talk about some of the specific things that we might be able to engage initiatives around. Um, certainly it's strengthening these networks of health uh, leaders. You know, you're training them. Many of them are listening in. 
I don't know how many of you, for example, have taken health communications as a course. I don't really, frankly, I'm learning how much of that is offered uh, at Duke. Um, but when we got into this pandemic, as I think Mandy will attest because she handled, she handled it well, but unfortunately there were many who didn't. Uh, and it's something that, that it's one area that we really wanna, wanna focus on. Um, another, uh, and we may wanna pilot this in places like Africa, we've talked to RISPA around this, is really strengthening capacity, the, the kind of competence issue that, um, that, that Mandy talked about. Um, and, then, and then finally, how can we design ways, there, there are lots of great examples like North Carolina that did it well, how can we take those case studies, uh, learn some lessons in the best kind of community engagement, and then start to spread that uh, and do it now before, before the next pandemic uh, hits. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to, back to you, uh, Krishna, and hopefully for a good, good discussion. Thanks, Jack. I think uh, fantastic to, to add in those um, political perspectives that are historical and, and very helpful as well. Uh, so really, I think, great set of perspectives across the board. Uh, thank you all. I think you teed up uh, an enormous uh, uh, set of nuanced uh, questions here. I want to start by something, Jack, you mentioned that we also got um, uh, from a virtual listener, which is around this idea of misinformation and disinformation, especially as we're seeing the growth in social media. So I'd love maybe to uh, to start, Mandy, with you as you had to deal with this in real time and, and any thoughts you have on, uh, on how we might handle the growing um, issues around misinformation, and then we'll open it up to anybody else that wants to jump in. Yeah, so, well, you heard in my transparency comment, we, we the press was an ally often in um, us being able to communicate, be transparent, answer questions, keep, keep and build trust. Um, and social media was a component of that too. The way, you know, we obviously at the state level don't have tools to take down misinformation to regulate um, these entities. So our approach to it was a flood the zone approach, right? We wanted to drown out the misinformation with putting out as much good information as we possibly could, but put out information from trusted sources. So yes, sometimes people got their information from me and that worked for a swath of folks, but a large, number of folks in North Carolina did not want to hear that from me. And so we thought about who did they already trust? And we did a ton of work, um, both, and, and whether it's TikTok videos or um, online things, you know, with, with trusted partners that we would work with uh, to carry that message. And again, it was sort of a flood the zone uh, attempt to say, how do we get trusted voices to drown out the misinformation? I, I had a policy of never repeating the misinformation to come out of my mouth. That was, we really tried hard to never say the misinformation, but find ways to debunk that without giving it more life. Because as soon as it comes out of my life, they come out of my mouth, they clipped it and used that as a, as a way to sort of further perpetuate it. So it's also being good about what you say at the front end, not repeating the myths, um, using trusted sources and flood the zone. Great advice, thank you. Anybody else, feel free to do I, I love flood the zone because we're in North Carolina. I guess we have to have basketball uh, <laughs> analogies. And I agree with you, that's, that's a huge, huge piece of it. But we do need to, and, I, and most of the social media platforms themselves were caught off guard at the very beginning of this. There's just as many public health officials were who, who gave, at least on the national level, a lot of conflicting information at first. And so over time, uh, many of them like, uh, Twitter and, and Facebook and others began to uh, put in place some some uh, regulations that allowed us to begin to take some of this off. But um, you know, as all of you know, for for men, many of these, particularly anti-vaxxers, it's also a, a commercial activity for them. Um, you can make a lot of money getting engagement online, uh, and if you find the right kind of the cohort that they go after and and these algorithms allow them to find them um that will just continue and i you know i do think that we need to talk about and we need to bring in as we as we tried to in bellagio many of these platforms themselves to really 
talk about what else they need to do so that we can at least uh, hold off some of the most you know, egregious examples of misinformation. And disinformation, you know, I think the, our laws haven't caught up, frankly, um, to start to prosecute these, these folks. Yeah, that's a, a big one. I, I just want to endorse the don't repeat the misinformation and try to give a, another narrative um, and and flood the zone. But I I think one of the things that we've seen um, is is just keeping it relevant. And I, I applaud you again for even mentioning TikTok because there are a lot of public health entities that are are dead scared of going into social media and that's where people live um not only but um to ignore it is just opening up the red carpet um uh, as you know it's a pretty messy space right now with a lot of the people who are doing the fact checking getting sacked um and the the uh, that space i think there's a limit to how much we can control it um, but I think in terms of the flooding the space, one of the things we've heard from people is we don't get why, um, you know, it's it's okay for Facebook and Twitter and the others to kind of flag things and say, go to WHO or go to NHS or go to CDC. But most, a lot of them say to us, we've been there. They don't have answers to our questions. And the one thing about um that we've found is uh, we've tried to do some chat bots, but that's also <laughs> going through a new uh, generation. But I think things like TikTok, I mean, one of the most successful things I saw was a collaboration um, with TikTok and uh, Purpose, and, and it was the UN group Verified, UN Verified. Um, and it was basically young scientists, young doctors who went on TikTok to answer people's questions in real time. And but it also kind of gave a glimpse. They, they became personalities, too. And you started to get to know them out of their lab coats, out of their their scrubs and, you know, actually buying bread or they ride a bicycle or something that made it more relatable, because I think the important thing is uh, on, in the online space is is making it relatable. And as one woman told me, I want I'll listen to people who look and talk like me. Anybody else want to jump into that? Yeah, maybe maybe I can come in and just share that. I think one of the challenges in terms of misinformation, like from our perspective, was how do you make sure that um, you know? Because people were very scared, and 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 people were not sure about what to do with. You know the fact that you can't go to work so you can't make a living and you can't put food on the table especially for those who have a daily wage um uh, situation um but one of the other challenges we also saw was how young people were perceiving um COVID 19. they were perceiving it as they were invincible right um to this and um one of the things that um i you know one of the uh, ministry of health uh, like for instance in kenya did was really engaged with um, the social media influencers in terms of, you know, um, and singers and, and and all these actors. And a lot of them actually did it by default, not even because they were called on by, you know, anyone particular. Just talking about this is where you should get your information. This, everyone is at risk. Do this also to protect other people, even though, you know, initially, you know, we we weren't thinking that um, young people could be as um, as as deeply affected as the el as elders. So it really was that because there was a challenge in where they were thinking they were invisible, but the second thing was also that they were, um, you know, passing infections at a very high rate because you know lockdown just you know made people go into this, you know, kind of feeling like you're getting cabin fever. So I think it was really important for them to get that message from, you know, again, people who look like them, people who sound like them, um, you know, especially people who they really respected. And the media as well was a really huge ally in terms of being able to communicate the message. And even the way these panels were set up, for instance, with the national media outlets was where you had someone who works in a hospital. So someone who's running a hospital and telling people there are literally no beds that we have anymore, but also somebody who works in the community sitting alongside, someone who works in policy and someone who works, um, you know, for instance, in 
in just engaging with communities. And when you saw those conversations in Sioux and people were calling in to ask questions, you could see that people were starting to get the message much more clearly. And um, even especially in the first times when we are starting to reduce some of the measures and people wanted to go back to life immediately and you were trying to give them, you know, to just take, take a slower pace. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, I'm gonna shift a, a little bit, um, picking up on points that you've all made and questions we've gotten online here um, around this idea. And Mandy, you brought up the, the idea that you saw providers who would otherwise be competitive start to work together. We've heard uh, the ways in which the public and private sector who are often at, uh, at odds uh, in day-to-day -day activities started to work together. Uh, so the question's really, you know, what are the lessons learned? What can we look to going forward? Are there principles? of how to actually bring multi-sectoral partners together, which is nice to say, but often doesn't happen in practice, especially at a time of crisis that we saw over the last several years. Well, it's a couple things we can think about. First is clarifying roles and responsibilities um, ahead of time. North Carolina had some practice in this. We have a lot of hurricanes. And so actually our health systems, business partners and others, particularly in the Eastern part of our state, had built relationships around emergencies before, and that was very useful. And we sort of used that playbook, but just expanded it across the whole state as we thought about that. So um, the times where I saw collaboration go well was during the hurricane, that was maybe five days of time, um, right? We had to sustain this over more than eight, you know 18 months. Um, so that, that was real. Um, and the other thing I, I would say, so roles and responsibility and clarity, the other is about shared data transparency, right? So uh, finding way folks were more willing to collaborate when they understood that there was a level playing field for, for certain things, right? If I knew how many um, open ICU beds and how many um, uh, ventilators, all of the different hospitals, there was, there was a a, a, more of a sense of like, okay, I, I feel like we're all being held accountable fairly to each other, apples to apples, and we're going to participate in this. Um, so I think that was helpful. And look, and healthcare, unfortunately, in North Carolina, uh, North Carolina, United States is a, is a business. And tapping into understanding what is driving their finances and figuring out how to align what you need done from a public health perspective with their financial need is really important. Vaccine was a good example. There was a there there we needed vaccines distributed equitably, fairly, and quickly. They wanted a brand building opportunity. We could we can match that up um, and from a financial perspective and as well as what we needed. Now I put we put a lot of parameters around how we wanted vaccines to be distributed, but it's still aligned with their their brand building opportunity from a hospital health system perspective. So I think also aligning incentives um, and figuring out how to unlock the power of the private sector um, in accomplishing public health goals. Yeah, I would just add to that that uh, Mandy's point about having plans in place ahead of time for what could amount to a needed all of government response is really important. Other groups like the National Association for State Health Policy in the U.S. have looked across the different kinds of state responses and different states are different. We have a federal system in the U.S., um, but what seems to be a common factor for success was running these efforts from the governor on down with lots of opportunities for local community leadership engagement, not just as a public health only activity. Public health is critical in this, but so are the abilities to engage the healthcare system. So are the abilities to engage businesses and help anticipate some of those questions that they're gonna be getting from the front line. I guess the second point I'd add to this is, you know, while these responses were good, um, the fact of the matter is we got a long way to go uh, here in the U.S. and around the world in closing the gap between what medical technology, public health science, and everything else that supports uh, a pandemic response makes possible and what we've been able to achieve. One of the themes coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic is the notice of warm capacity. You know, if you have, you can put plans in place, but the more that you have systems in place that are being exercised on a regular ba basis, maybe not at this scale and scope, but exercise on a regular basis to address these challenges, 
is really important. And to that end, both here in the United States and around the world, and, and I'd appreciate uh, views from RISPA and Heidi on this too, is just how important it is to have strong primary care systems in place to help deal with what are uh, what could be trusted local relationships, especially with people who are at high risk for complications from whatever comes along, and the ability to get good uh, at sharing information that's needed to help engage people in reducing all kinds of risk where we have the capacity to do testing, we have the capacity to do treatment, um, whether it's you know hep C and COVID or diabetes in the United States or malaria and HIV in other parts of the world, those systems are not well developed. Having them, strengthening them now uh, so they can be in a better position to help augment that public health only response in a public health emergency is really important. You know, I know we just have a few minutes, but just a quick on because on the public private issue, employers, all the research that, that we've seen um, on, on trust and on civility, by the way, which is something else we track, employers um, come out very much at the top, usually much more than government or even in some cases, the church, uh, which is surprising to me, but it's, it's, and it's been a real change over the last 10 years. And in health, Many employers have been a little bit hesitant to communicate too much HIPAA and other things um, other than their own benefits. But in this case, you know, employees were telling us in surveys that they would trust employers with, with information. And so we also need to think of, of them as another um, uh, avenue to communicate. Yeah. Great. Any final thoughts here from, from others? <clears throat> I, I just uh, want to endorse the uh, the thought to take this beyond uh, the, the pandemic is what do they say every crisis is an opportunity and we are not out of the woods yet and we have a huge opportunity in COVID recovery to build that trust. Um, there's been a lot that didn't get done. There were a lot of good things that happened. How can we keep that that fabric that was built going and where we I mean COVID was a great exposer of the weak spots but also found some innovation so I think people are going to remember there's there's life before and after COVID and we want them to remember good stuff that'll help build our trust and so we've got a little time to do that not a lot but um, we should be on it <laughs> thank you Rispa. Yeah, sure. Just to quickly mention, you know, what, what why it's so important to, you know, pick up after after all of this is that, um, you know, right now we're going through uh, the recovery period and um, economically, socially, politically. Um, and I think one of the things that um, was really important on the region was the establishment of the AU COVID-19 commission. Um, and one of the things that happened as a result of this commission was that Africa's recovery, well, AMREF was tasked with Africa's, like the, the committee on Africa's recovery. So part of that work was actually um, working on health workforce. And one of the things we've actually done is we've had several consultative processes on the continent um, around health workforce. And it's actually led to the establishment through the approval from the AU um, on a health workforce task team. Um, and that means that there's actually, you know, a unified regional um, a team who's responsible for just focusing on how do you make sure that um, health workforce issues are addressed um, and how do you seep these into other aspects of primary health care, universal health coverage, and many other things that, you know, um, plague the continent in terms of challenges for the health system. So that's what I wanted to mention in conclusion. Well, thank you all. This is a fascinating conversation that we could certainly continue for some time. Unfortunately, we're the end of our short time together. Um, love to thank all of our speakers today. What a fantastic group we've had. Mandy Cohen, Heidi Larson, Rispa Walumbe, Jack Leslie, Mark McClellan, each of you bringing fantastic expertise and perspectives to this rich conversation. Uh, we heard about really some of the core principles that have to um, enable trust to be built, uh, starting and centering our work on equity as we heard 
making sure that transparency and accountability really are driving forces of systems. Uh, and then coming back to what we started to, to layer into those three C's, so the community, really how important that community is, how we define it, how we find uh, that trust ecosystem over time at the community level. The second round communications that our leaders, uh, not just in public health, but more broadly have to have the communication skills to understand, especially with new channels of communication being so prevalent. Uh, and these are opportunities for us to train current leaders and future leaders in those spaces. Uh, and then third around this idea of confidence that you've got to be able to execute and follow through that people and systems have to be trustworthy for us to maintain trust in systems going forward. Uh, thank you all again for a great conversation. Please stay engaged with us as we do our best to pull together a, a global community to move this effort forward uh, out of this uh, and other networks. Uh, one plug for this issue around social media and misinformation, we'll be holding another Think Global session uh, later in the spring that goes uh, much deeper into that area as well. So more to come on this and other related issues. Thank you all and have a good morning, afternoon, and evening around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.